may take your seats. Oh, I'm so glad to be back with you. You never know how you did when you spoke somewhere until they invite you back. And you say, oh, that was pretty good. All right. So thank you so much for inviting me back. Thanks for Pastor Greg, Pastor Charity, Pastor Faith. I appreciate all of you all. Can we give a big hand clap to your leadership and all the volunteers and leaders who are making this happen? You all are special people. Y'all know that. You, you all are special people. It takes a special kind of person to volunteer for youth ministry. People who are courageous, people who are fearless, People who are good looking, those are the kind of people that volunteer in youth ministry. Amen. Can I get an amen from the youth leaders? There you go. Those are the good looking ones that are saying amen the loudest. Well, how you guys doing? Oh man, this is great. I'm so glad to be back with you. I know a lot has gone down over the last, uh, oh, what, 12 months since I've been uh, gone away from you, but I am so glad that even though protocols might change, even though regulations might change, even though CDC advisements may change, our God never changes. God was a healer pre-pandemic, and he's a healer post-pandemic. He was a healer then, he's a healer now, and he'll continue to be a healer. And that's my job today to teach you about Jesus as the healer. So we're going to be in class this morning. I'm going to teach. You know, I get a little excited sometimes, so I dabble in the preach, but I'm going to try to just teach. And I think it's going to be real good for you. And, uh, and I think you're going to get something out of it. Let me start my timer um, so I don't preach two hours. Just kidding. You're the only one who laughed at my bad joke. All right. Seeing Jesus as the healer, you know, um, I believe that it's hard to see Jesus as the healer if you've never seen him heal or you've never experienced his healing power in your own body because perception is reality, right? So we can talk about Jesus being the healer all day in theory, but we have to experience him as our healer. And that's not only physically, that could be emotionally. That can be mentally. Shout out to this young lady who has a sweatshirt on that says virginity rocks. Come on now. She busting. All right. My youth taught me that. My youth taught me that. So I might be getting a little too old to be cool, but you know, it's cool. Shout out to you. I believe that uh, God said something to me as I was praying for you. God wants to change your countenance by changing your attitude this summer. Now, that doesn't mean you have a bad attitude, but maybe that's for somebody in here. God bless you. Maybe that's for somebody in here that God wants to change your attitude this summer. What is it? Maybe attitude towards something, attitude towards someone, maybe attitude towards the things of God and things of the word of God, period. Maybe the attitude towards yourself. Woo, felt the Holy Ghost on that one. The attitude towards yourself. Sometimes we can put up with a lot of mess in life if we don't value ourselves correctly, if we don't understand who we are in Christ, if we don't understand that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is alive today and it's alive in me. Christ in you, the hope of glory. So part of my story is, as I grew up in a pastoral household, my dad and my parents didn't really believe in keeping much medicine in the house. We didn't have like a medicine cabinet. I'm not dissing medicine cabinets. I'm not saying one thing or the other. I'm just saying for our house. This is how I grew up. My word of faith children, you all already know. So we didn't have any medicine in the house. So what did that mean for me? Well, when I wasn't feeling well, that, that, that didn't mean that I was immune to not feeling well or immune to sickness. It meant that when I wasn't feeling well, my dad would not give me an Advil pill, he would give me the Goss pill. See what I did there? And so he had me memorize this scripture. He would have me say this scripture out loud seven times every hour during the day if I wasn't feeling well. Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 5. I love that. You all are writing notes. That's fantastic. Somebody wants to go somewhere. Note takers are also history makers. 
Isaiah 53, verse 5. I don't know why I'm looking down because I know it's by heart. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Some versions say we were healed. I had to say this all the time. And man, let me tell you, sometimes I did not like it. Not because I didn't like God. Not because I didn't think he could heal. I just thought it was kind of annoying. I just was like, why do I have to recite the scripture all the time? Can you just give me the ibuprofen, the ibuprofen, just grab it, put it in my hand. I'll take it with this water. But I know what he was doing. And it took me into my adult life to finally understand that he was helping me recalibrate my expectations. He was helping me to see Jesus as my healer. He didn't want me to see Advil as my healer. He didn't want me to see Robitussin as my healer. He didn't want me to see the other things as my healer. There's nothing wrong with taking that stuff. There's no condemnation. But he wanted me to calibrate an expectation that healing comes from God. And I appreciate him for doing that. Dad used the strategy of confessing the word continuously to help me see Jesus as my healer. I think that was a pretty good strategy. I didn't know it then, but I know it now. Confessing the word of God helps to recalibrate your perspective. Write it down if you're taking notes. Confessing the word of God helps you recalibrate your perspective. Some of you all, as you are young, you're growing up in church. So you hear about confessing the word of God all the time. Sometimes you might be convinced and might start to think like, what's the big deal? Why do I have to confess the word all the time? Like confession, like you tell other people about confession. They think something Catholic, like you're going to see a priest or something. But let me tell you what confession does. Confessing the word of God And biblical meditation is how you change your expectation and shift your perspective. It's also how you build your faith, right? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the... Thank you, Bible scholars. Praise God. It says in Exodus chapter 15, verse 26, we're going to go to quite a bit of scriptures, but this is internship, right? All right, so that's okay. You can just write them down. Exodus chapter 15 and verse 26. And it says, if you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases on you, which I brought on the Egyptians. For I am the Lord who heals you. This translates, the Lord who heals you translates as Jehovah Rapha. The Lord who heals you. Who's ever heard of that term before Jehovah Rapha? Praise God. So... When I say, who's the healer, I want you to say Jesus, okay? So let's try it one time. Who's the healer? Jesus. All right. Y'all did pretty good that first time. Y'all are awake and alive. The spirit of caffeine is running through this place, huh? Come on. So we believe in caffeine. And so, who's the healer? Jesus. All right. Now it says that he's the Lord God who heals us. But it said that if you do what is right in his sight and give ear to all his commandments and keep them, he won't put any of these diseases on you. So keep you in good health if you behave well. So that was the old covenant. Thank God we have a new covenant. Because everybody ain't quite living right or doing the right thing. I thank God that we do not live under the old covenant. Probably a majority of the people who call themselves Christians will be dead (laughs) under the old covenant. That's just how it would be. (laughs) But it says in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6 in the New Living Translation. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6 in the New Living Translation. It says, but now Jesus, who, shout out, our high priest has been given a ministry that is far superior, say far superior, far superior, to the old priesthood. For he is the one who mediates for us a far better, say far better, far better. covenant with God based on better promises. So the old covenant was based on what you did. So God says, I will do 
if you do. If you do not do, I will not do. And if you do the wrong thing, you will be in deep (laughs) doo-doo. Scratch that last part. But you get what I'm saying. And so that's the old covenant. I appreciate my man right here. He said, that's a good joke, Pastor David. So that's the old covenant. But the new covenant, it's not based on what we do. When Jesus died for us, It is now based on what Jesus did, his obedience, his better promises that he made available to us, God made available through us, to us through the vehicle of Jesus Christ. That's called grace. So now, even though we're not perfect, even though we didn't always do the right thing, say the right thing, even though we don't always show up faithfully for youth service, (laughs) but God still heals us. But God still delivers us. He still makes it available to us. So this is the better covenant based on better promises. So what does this mean? That means through the agency of Jesus Christ and what grace did, Jesus died to provide healing for every believer who would believe on him. That's amazing. I'm so glad about that. It says in Psalms chapter 107, verse 20, it says, he sent his word and healed them. He sent his word and healed them. So that's the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, he says in John chapter 1, verse 14, he says this, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So he sent his word and healed them. And then the word became flesh. What does that mean? That means Jesus came to the earth. That was the word becoming flesh. So what we can do is put these two scriptures together and say that, wait a minute. God sent Jesus and healed them and made healing available for them. It says in Acts chapter 10, verse 38. It says this. Acts 10, 38. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit, and with, say, power, Power. who went about doing good, say good, Good. and healing all, say all, All. who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. What's after all? Nothing. I mean, all is inclusive of everything, right? right, right. So does that mean he had the power to heal cancer? Does that mean he had the power to heal AIDS? Does that mean he had the power to heal paralysis? What about sickle cell anemia? What about anxiety or depression? What about COVID-19? You're telling me that Jesus had the power to heal all this stuff? Isn't that amazing? No matter the diagnosis, the prognosis is you are healed. By his stripes, you are healed. Now, why does God do this? It says in John chapter 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever shall believe on him shall not perish, perish, good job, but shall have everlasting life. John chapter 10, verse 10 says, The thief cometh not but to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that you might have life and life more abundantly. Abundant life does not mean chronic sickness. Abundant life does not mean adapting to diagnoses or having to just live with it. Abundant life doesn't mean that I should have to live under circumstances. Abundant life means that I can live on top of circumstances. That God is powerful enough to change my circumstances. That's abundant life. So why did God do this? Why did God make Jesus available for us? Why did God make healing available to us through Jesus? One word, love. Love. Say love. Love. Who's the healer? Jesus. You were quick. I see you. I see you. Who's the healer? Jesus. All right. So, faith connects us with miracles, but love makes it available. God's love is what made it available for us. If you're writing notes, write this down and then underline it. Healing is an expression of God's love. 
Come on, you're going to preach this with me. I appreciate that. Healing is an expression of God's love. One more time. Healing is an expression of God's love. So here's what happens sometimes to believers, young and old. Sometimes we could be tempted to think that we're not good enough for God's healing. Let's keep it 100. I come from Chicago, came way too far, spent too much time traveling yesterday to water it down for you. I'm going to just give it to you real potent. Sometimes we shame ourselves into thinking that because we're not good enough, we are not good enough for God's love or his healing. Because God wouldn't have approved of my choices last night, he won't heal me today. Now, God wants us to live holy and acceptable unto him, right? He wants us to live a life that's blameless. He wants us not to be submitted to sin, but to triumph over sin, right? We are not free to sin. We're free from sin. But we can be tempted to think that we're not good enough. What if I missed it? What if I made a mistake? Does God keep his scorecard, right? Because is God keeping his good Christian report card? And if I'm getting a passing grade, then I'll get healed. Then I'll get blessed, right? Then he'll deliver me. He'll give me peace if I'm averaging a B in my good Christian checklist. It might be kind of funny, but this is what we do. Because so much of our life is merit-based. Even our relationship with other people, friends, family members, sometimes some of you all have even experienced parents that I don't get as much love when I don't behave a certain way. Ooh, I know what I'm talking about. I don't get into the school that I want to get into if I'm not right here. I don't make the team if my skills don't make the cut. A lot of our lives are merit-based, but God says, you don't need a merit because I've given you something that's without merit. It's called grace. It equals unmerited favor. That means that you didn't deserve it. You can't disqualify from it, and you always qualify for it. There were multiple places in the gospel where it says that Jesus healed them all. He healed everybody in the crowd. Now, everybody in the crowd couldn't have been living right. Come on, you know Pastor Cherry, right? I mean, you know, usually 80-20 rule. Hopefully 80% are living right, not the 20%. But, you know, it's not everybody who's perfect. As a matter of fact, none of us are perfect. But it said that Jesus healed them all. Why? Because love or healing is an expression of God's love. A lot of times in the scriptures it says Jesus was moved with compassion. You know what that compassion is? It's, it's that mercy. Yeah. It's that, that favor. It's, that, that, it's God's love expressed even though you don't deserve it. He was moved with compassion. It says in Matthew chapter 20 verse 30 in the NIV. Matthew chapter 20 and verse 30 in the NIV. Two blind men were sitting by the roadside, and when they heard that Jesus was going by, they shouted, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. The crowd rebuked them and told them, man, y'all need to be quiet. But they shouted all the louder, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. And Jesus stopped and called them, look, I hear y'all calling out my name. (laughs) What do y'all want me to do for you? He asked. And Lord, they answered, we want our sight. And Jesus had what? Had compassion. He had compassion on them and touched their eyes. And immediately they received their sight and followed him. Now, I'm going to say a couple statements that will really make you think. Are you ready? My grandma used to say, this will really bake your noodle. Jesus didn't ask them if they had received salvation first. He didn't ask them if they had gone to church. He didn't even ask them if they were a consistent tither, even though these things are good. And salvation is extremely important. All they had to do was believe. 
That's all they had to do. A person that you're praying for, we want them to get saved, but they don't even need to be saved to receive healing from God. I've laid hands on people who don't believe God, but they believe that healing is possible and that's all God needs. They're not religious. They haven't gone to church. They don't know nothing about no Bible study or no youth group. Certainly about no summer internship. But yet, they can still encounter the power of God. Now, why is this possible? How is this possible? John chapter 1, verse 17. It gives us a little bit of insight. I love to explain why and then how. I think the why is that for God so loved the world that he gave his love for us. But let's talk about also how. John chapter 1, verse 17. It says this. For the law was given through Moses, but grace, say grace. Grace. Do we have anybody in here named Grace? Do we have any graces in here? Grace. Oh, we have a Gracie? Hey, Gracie. But grace and truth came through who? Who did it come through? It came through Jesus Christ. Grace and truth. So what did I say grace was? Unmerited favor. Favor that you don't deserve. Let's say access to healing that you may not deserve. It said grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Now, did truth come first in that scripture or did grace come first? Grace Grace came first. So this gives us some insight on how Jesus would operate. See, what happened was Jesus came with grace and truth. Grace was first. Grace is the unmerited favor. It was something that people didn't earn or deserve. Why did he put it in this order? Because grace coming first helped them to better receive the truth coming next. So they may not come to church, right? Right. They may not have a relationship with God yet, but you say, can I pray for you? And you lay hands on them or you pray with them, God bless you, and the healing power of God hits their body. And then they want to know more about your God. They want to hear about the truth after an encounter with God's power. And sometimes it'll bring them to tears because some of them will feel so low, they'll say, what did I do to earn this? What did I do to deserve this? And we say, it's by grace. Who doesn't want to know that kind of God? Who doesn't want to know a God who heals them in spite of everything that they've done? Who wouldn't want that kind of truth? And they say, well, I, I want this truth of this gospel. If this is how your God is, I want this. A lot of times when we're talking about healing, especially if you've been dealing with something that has been chronic, let's say, you know, maybe something you've been dealing with for some years or a parent or family member has been dealing with for some years, a lot of times it will try to, over time, affect your thinking and affect your believing that even though you're still saying, hey, well, I'm, I'm believing God that he can heal this thing. I know God is a healer. I'm, I'm believing by faith that this healing will manifest in my body. But what happens is, over time, the enemy tries to develop in your mind what's called a mental stronghold that tries to prohibit healing by limiting your ability to believe. I'm switching gears just a little bit. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4 and then I'm going to go to Scripture, and then I'm going to give you a personal example, a personal story. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4. It says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God, for the pulling down of what? Strongholds. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. This is really important. Now, what is a stronghold? A stronghold, let me define this for you, because you might have heard this scripture before. I'm sure you've heard Pastor Faith quote this scripture at some point before. What is a stronghold? A consistently negative thought pattern in an area or about a situation. That's a stronghold. A consistently negative thought pattern in an area 
or about a situation, a consistently negative thought pattern in an area or about a situation. Now, actually, technically, a stronghold could be good, too, if it's a consistently consistent pattern of thinking, but we're talking about it in the negative sense. So what is a stronghold? As you look this up in the Greek, you define this. A stronghold is like a fortress. Anybody ever seen like a castle or a fortress? Anybody ever been to one before? Um, I actually had a chance to travel with my wife to Rome uh, three years ago, and we went to the Vatican. You know, that's where the Pope is, right? And so it's basically a giant fortress. I mean, the walls are super thick. They have guards and everybody. You cannot get up in that joint unless you have a ticket or have some official business. They will stop you right there. It is a fortress. What is a fortress meant to do? It's meant to keep the bad guys out, right? It's meant to keep the good guys in. But sometimes what will happen is in the attempt to keep the bad guys out and the good guys in, what will happen is that inadvertently the enemy will try to work his deception And instead of guarding against the bad stuff, we start drawing a wall up against the truth of the word of God. And so the enemy over time will get you to try to think that, oh, you know, this healing can't happen for you. Or, oh, you know, this is a situation you'll just have to live with. Or, oh, you know, this is what you can expect for the rest of your life or what your parent or loved one could expect. And so he'll try to draw up this mental stronghold to feed unbelief. That's a lot of times what it's about. I mean, people have mental strongholds and mental blockages about God's ability to heal them. Let me me take that back. About their ability to be healed by God's power. Because it's one thing to say, yeah, I know God is a healer, but it's another thing to expect healing from God. Faith, the Greek word pistis, it means a divine persuasion. I'm divinely persuaded that God is not just a healer. He's my healer, and he's going to heal my body. He's already provided healing for me, and my body has to line up with the word of God. So what are, what are mental strongholds? I believe that the enemy, he tries to portray these mental strongholds in three different ways. Write this down if you're writing notes. Three different ways. He tries to make it personal. Example, it's because I'm bad and not worthy of healing that I'm not being healed. It's because of something that they did or something in their past. It's because, you know, they don't really go to church much, maybe on Christmas and Easter. Tries to get us to make it personal maybe about our shortcomings a mental stronghold about healing. And then he tries to make it pervasive. That means generalized to every event. He'll try to spread it out. So it started as a blockage of me being healed, but now it's spreading in other areas. Well, you know, because God doesn't approve of me, that's why he's not blessing me financially or, or that's why, you know, my relationships aren't going well or I'm not doing well in school and, and nothing seems to kind of be going right. And we start generalizing. That's how the enemy works, unbelief. And number three, permanent. He tries to convince us that the way it is is how it always will be. That the way it is, is how it always will be. I'm here to tell you that that's simply not the truth. How do you get unbelief out? Through good Bible-based, faith-filled teaching. I believe a lot of times, you know, Jesus, he taught them and then followed it up with miracle signs and wonders because he had to teach out that unbelief. You have to get their believing in line into a place where they could receive from God. Mark chapter 5 and verse 25. I'm going to read out of the New Living Translation. Mark chapter 5 and verse 25. Who's the healer? Jesus. And it says this. Jesus went with him and all the people followed, crowding around him. 
And a woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. She had suffered a great deal from many doctors. And over the years, she had spent everything she had to pay them. But had not, or, but she had gotten no better. So now she's broken sick. Yeah. In fact, she had gotten worse. Who's going to be real right now? Have you ever prayed about something or been believing God for something? Yeah. And it seems like since you've been believing God, it got worse? Yeah. It's okay. You don't have to put up your hands. I, I appreciate, I appreciate the, <laughs> the honesty. I've had it happen too. And it said, she had heard about Jesus. <laughs> so she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his robe. For she thought to herself, and I think that this is not a good translation because it says in the Greek, for she said to herself. Yeah. I believe she kept saying, yeah. as one translation says. So she kept saying to herself, we can even say the self-talk, right? You know what self-talk is? It's the conversation you have with yourself about yourself or about somebody else, but it's just with you. It's like looking in the mirror and you, you telling yourself what you think of yourself or what you think about them or that text message or whatever it is. So for she thought or said to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. That sounds like believing to me, right? If I could just touch his robe, if I could just get to Jesus, because he's the healer. Who's the healer? Jesus. If I could just touch his robe, I will be healed. And what happened? She came up, she touched. Immediately the bleeding stopped. And she can feel in her body that she had been healed of her terrible condition. Jesus realized at once that healing power had gone out from him. So we turned around in the crowd and asked, oh, now who touched my robe? Yeah. Which one of y'all touched me? And the disciples said to him, Jesus, come on, for real? Look at the crowd that's pressing around you. How can you ask who touched me? You got him and him and him and she touched you and they touched you. This little boy probably touched you too. <laughs> but he kept on looking around to see who had done it. Now, why was her touch significant? Because her touch came with a believing. A hundred people can sit in an auditorium and hear the so message good. of the gospel, can hear a message about healing. But somebody who's believing for healing can touch the power of God. That you can get healed in the midst of me talking about healing. Because it's not about me laying hands on you, even though that's good too. It's about your belief system. This lady touched his garment. She tugged on his shirt and got healed. Yeah, come on. And then he kept on looking around to see who had done it. Then the frightened woman, trembling at the realization of what had happened to her, came and fell to her knees in front of him and told him what she had done. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. Imagine four years, four years, 12 years, yeah. Yeah. So 12 years of dealing with this infirmity. Yeah. Now, I believe that it was the Holy Ghost. I believe it was God who spoke to her, who gave, gave her the idea of touching the hem of his garment. Who does that? I mean, that's not like a regular thought. Right. Yeah. That's not like a, let me go down to the pharmacy and fulfill yeah. This, you know, this medication prescription I got. She said, if I could just touch the edge of his robe. Yeah. Yeah. See, I believe what happens is when we start believing God and we start confessing the word of God, then the agency of the Holy Spirit goes into motion and God starts speaking to us good. Good. about what we need to do to bring that manifested healing to our bodies. Sometimes it could be going to a specific service. Sometimes it could just be receiving it right there on the spot. Sometimes it could be as simple as God speaking to you about some natural changes that you have to make in life. Yeah. I prayed for people before to get healing, and God actually started speaking to me about their diet. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. I've had God speak to me about, you're allergic to this and you don't know it. Yeah. 
by just a word of knowledge, by the Holy Spirit. And they'll come back and say, Pastor Dave, that was it. They were believing for healing, but the Holy Ghost knows how to get you healed. And sometimes we're just not aware of it, so we need his help. So as we meditate the word of God, I believe that by faith, that starts to turn into an action. So I'll give you a real example. Y'all want to hear a story? Story time. All right, so I don't believe I told this story last time I was here. If I did, tell it again. But anyways, so when, uh, listen, about maybe four years ago or so, my daughter Lily, she's 10 right now, she had developed this kind of, um, I guess this kind of stomach condition where she was constantly having stomach pain in her body, like in, in her stomach, in her intestines. And we didn't know what was going on. And, you know, sometimes, you know, kids have stomach aches. So we thought, oh, you know, just at, at the early stages, we thought, oh, maybe she's just kind of fighting a little stomach virus or something. Or, you know, maybe something's going on that's temporary. But then it persisted. And then some days turned into some weeks. And some weeks turned into some months. And as a father, I'm like, okay, God, hold on. We're, we're you know, we're, we're believers we're children of God. We're under this new covenant. Yeah. This is not our portion. What is going on? And so we're praying and believing for a healing. Now, it wouldn't be constant all day, every day. But after she would eat or certain times during the day, it seemed like it would just come upon her to the point where it was making her miss days of school sometimes. And she just couldn't, she couldn't get up. She couldn't walk or be mobile. All she could do was lay in the bed or just kind of curl up on the couch. Sometimes that pain would bring her to tears. Sometimes it would end in in nausea and and other kinds of things. So we took her to the doctor, right? Like a good parent, you know, we're believing for healing, but we took her to the doctor and said, okay, well, you know, let's see what's going on. They couldn't tell us what was going on. They said, well, maybe she's allergic to dairy. So maybe she's lactose intolerant. Okay, cool, easy done. We'll go dairy free. That didn't help. And they said, well, maybe it's gluten, maybe gluten uh, sensitivity, gluten intolerant. Took her off gluten. That didn't help. Go back to the doctor like, yo, what's, what's going on? And they said, well, you know, we don't, we don't really know. What do you do when your child's dealing with something that's chronic, that's causing them much pain, discomfort, and a disruption in their daily lives? And the doctor doesn't know what to do. What do you do? You got to appeal to a higher place. You got to go to a different doctor. Because God knows all about us. He knows how he made us. And he also has the power to heal us. If there's anything that's going on in our bodies that are not lining up with the word of God. I'd like to say this was over in some weeks. But this persisted for months. And me and Nikki are just speaking the word of God over her. We're believing for her healing. And so we have uh, at work, we had a couple of the staff from Apostle Maldonado's church who has a very strong and big healing ministry. And they came over and we're doing some administrative things. We're sharing about some ministry things. And so it didn't have anything to do with with pulpit ministry. We're talking about administrative parts of the ministry. And during their visit, the last day that we were meeting on a Friday, it was about 4.45 p.m. We were going to have to end the meeting at 5 because they had to go to the airport to go back to Miami. And my wife, she texts me, and she says, hey, I know Apostle Maldonado's people are there with you. Do you mind asking those ladies to pray over Lily? Now, I'm going to keep it real with y'all. Flew too far to water it down. As a man of God, a man of faith, a pastor myself, Pastor Winston's son, my flesh kind of felt a kind of way about asking somebody else to pray for my daughter. I'm like, well, I got faith. I had the same access to God. I wasn't mad about it, but it was more like their faith isn't any different from my faith. We both know faith teaching. We both know the healing power of God. So at first... My first inclination, my first thought was to feel a little salty, like, are they more anointed than I am? 
Does God listen to them differently than he listens to me? I was almost tempted to kind of like, you know, kind of scoff at it and get a little offended. That was just about 30 to 60 seconds. But then the Holy Ghost kicked in and said, do you want pride or do you want healing? I said, okay, Holy Ghost, okay. (laughs) I see how you do your boy. But I want healing. Please, I want healing. So I said, you know, we kind of concluded that part of the meeting and I said, hey, I know, you know, I, I, you know, I know you all are faith people, so this isn't strange, but I know it's a little bit off what our topic has been over the last couple weeks or a couple days. I said, do you mind praying for my daughter? I explained just a little bit of what was going on briefly. And I said, can you all just pray for her right here? And they said, absolutely, let's do it. So for about the next seven and a half minutes, we just entered into prayer and I just agreed with them as they uh, took a couple turns praying interceding for her. And so we prayed, we ended, amen. And so we're wrapping up about 10 or 15 minutes later, my wife, she texts me and she says, Lily wants to go to gymnastics. She says she's feeling better. Now she was having an episode that that right at that moment when Nikki had texted me about asking for prayer, she was having an episode. She had stayed home from school because she couldn't get up out of bed. And I was like, well, you know, she stayed home from school. You know, maybe going to gymnastics is, is not such a good idea. You know, I mean, you know, that's not a good look, you know. I mean, she said, but she feels like all better. And, and she said, did you all pray yet? And I said, actually, yeah, we, we finished about 15 minutes ago. And I said, okay, well, you know, maybe we wait about 30 more minutes. Let, let God give you know, a little time to work. And so but they, she said, no, she feels better. She texts me back 15 minutes later. She, she feels better. I said, okay, well, I guess just take her on. So they went to gymnastics. We did gymnastics for two hours. I came back home. Felt fine. Next morning, felt good still. Went to school. Two more days later, still feeling good. We said, okay, well, I guess, you know, we can maybe give her some gluten. I, you know, we'll try it out. Had gluten that day, felt fine. Next day, she was like, Daddy, I want some cheese. I was like, but you know, <laughs> eh, I don't know. That's you, huh? I said, I want some cheese. I said, okay, well, we'll try a slice of cheese. Not that soy cheese. I'm talking about regular dairy, real cheese. And uh, she, was, she felt fine. Next day, she had some pizza. She felt fine. Week later, she still feels fine. To this day, she's been completely healed with no trace of what she was dealing with before. If you know God is a healer, I need somebody to shout amen. amen. Who's the healer? Jesus. Still to this day, no explanation of what was going on. Now, after seeing her deal with that for months and months, it starts to affect you psychologically. Yeah. Now it's a battle to keep our belief up because yeah. I'm watching my daughter battle this daily. But faith will always cause you to move outside of your comfort zone. Yeah. Faith will always cause you to move outside of your comfort zone. That's right. And I believe because we stayed in faith, my wife was able to discern yes. the opportunity that God had arranged. I know they came there not for that. I know the staff came to meet with me not for that reason, but I truly believe that God arranged that meeting because of Lily. We could have done it at any other time, but God put on their heart that they needed to come to Chicago at that time. God loves you so much that he'll rearrange people's schedules. He'll rearrange protocols and procedures. He'll rearrange things in their life and your life to get you the healing that you're believing for. How does healing come? I want to talk about four things and then we'll try to quickly um, start to bring it to a close. How does healing come? Four, four main points, especially when you're praying for healing or praying for healing for someone else. Number one, when I'm praying for healing for someone, I, first of all, I rebuke the sickness. Rebuke the sickness, the pain, the infirmity, the disease, whatever it is that's causing the discomfort. I'm going to rebuke that thing. 
We have power over the enemy and everything that he would do. I have news for you that sickness, disease, and pain is illegal activity in your body. Because as a blood-bought believer, you have access to divine health, not just divine healing, divine health. Number one, rebuke sickness. Number two, command healing. That's pretty simple so far. Absolutely. This ain't even deep. You do not have to have a theological degree to pray for someone to get healed. Rebuke sickness. Number two, command healing. Number three, release comfort. What is comfort? Like, release them to sit on the couch? Nah. The comfort of the Holy Ghost. He's the comforter, right? So while healing is manifesting in their bodies, we're going to release the comfort of the Holy Ghost to come upon them. And number four, my last one, declare wholeness over their lives. When Jesus told this woman, said that your faith has made you whole, your faith has made you well, you know, wholeness, let me explain this. Wholeness, Wholeness is different from healing, right? Because healing could be, you know, I have this hurt or this pain. Could be internal hurt or pain. But wholeness affects anything that was suffered due to the illness or due to the condition. Relationships, finances, your peace of mind, your relationship with God, internally your feelings. When we talk about wholeness, we're talking about taking what was broken and bringing it back and making it whole like that thing had never existed. I spent a lot of money on medical bills. Wholeness says, God, you can bring it back. I've lost some relationships due to my bad attitude from dealing with my chronic diseases. God, you can mend those relationships. Real quickly, number one, rebuke sickness. Number two, command healing. Number three, release comfort. Number four, declare wholeness. In Mark chapter 2, and we don't have to go there for the sake of time. In Mark chapter 2, we have a paralytic who was brought by four friends, four good friends, because they were carrying this man on a bed. They lowered him down through the hole in the house. Actually, they made the hole in the house, which I would have a whole problem with. But, you know, that's probably the fleshly part of me talking about. And they lowered him on to the ground where Jesus was. These are four good friends. Come on, how many of y'all got some good friends who will stick with you through thick and thin? Amen. And if you don't, I pray that you get some. But, so they lowered him down. And then he said, your sins are forgiven you. And then the Pharisees and the doubters, they were like, hey, how can you forgive sins? And several verses later, he told the man, rise, take up your bed and walk. He commanded him to be healed. Notice, he forgave the sins before he commanded him to be healed. Because a lot of times, that forgiveness of sins is necessary because people have shame and guilt that is literally closing the door to their healing. Whether it be mental healing, emotional healing, physical healing. Remember we talked about that feeling of not being worth being healed. Not being worthy to be healed. And he forgave his sins before he healed his physical body. He removed shame so that he could receive healing. In Luke chapter 4 and verse 18, Luke chapter 4 and verse 18, it says this. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, so to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Go back to the first scripture, verse 18. This part is important. To heal the brokenhearted. That the healing that God provides is not just physical healing, but to heal those who have been broken into pieces. There might be some of you here that have been suffering some hurt inside, internally. Maybe there might have been abuses suffered. Maybe missed expectation. Maybe you lost some friends. Maybe you lost a family member due to COVID. And and this one really hit home. 
this really hurt. Or maybe there's been some other things that you've been going through that the enemy is trying to talk you into hating yourself. But it says that Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted, to bring peace and comfort and restoration and wholeness from the inside out. See, I believe that forgiveness oftentimes can be the first step to internal healing. Forgiveness. You know, in the Jewish culture, they had the misconception that if someone was sick or they were paralyzed, they or someone in their family had to have sinned. That was the belief in the culture. It actually says in John chapter 9, we won't go there, but this man who was paralyzed, the people asked, who sinned, this man or his parents? See, notice that they equated sin with paralysis, with sickness. But Jesus said, no, no, it's not about that, but that the works of God, the glory of God shall be manifested. I'm here to ask you today, who do you need to forgive? Maybe there's someone you need to forgive. You've been believing for God's love and his healing to come over you, and maybe it's not physical, maybe it's something internal. But I'm here to tell you that forgiveness opens the door for healing to take place. Forgiveness opens that door. When we don't forgive others or ourselves, it can lead to torment. As a matter of fact, it says in Psalms chapter 147 and verse 3, He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He heals the brokenhearted. In Mark chapter 5, we see this man at the coastline, the demoniac who was, had many demons inside of him. And what was he doing? They tried to bind him with chains but couldn't hold him. And he was in the cave and in the tombs, cutting himself with stones. I believe this is symbolic. What are caves and tombs? Well, those are dark places. Those are places where people go to hide. Internal pain can be interesting because sometimes other people, they don't even know about it, right? You can smile on the outside while hurting on the inside. While the enemy is trying to make you suffer on the inside. And then what was was he doing? He was cutting himself with stones. Well, I know your culture and and, and your generation is very familiar with cutting and the things that come with that. But I like to zero in on the part with stones. Because you remember the old law was written on tablets or stones. I believe this man was punishing himself with the thought that he could never be enough. He could never do enough. Punishing himself with the law. I can never live up to these expectations. And maybe some of us have taken on those same qualities where we're punishing ourselves for past failures and defeats past relationships that have gone wrong or maybe a bad relationship with a parent and you're saying, maybe I deserve this. Maybe I just wasn't good enough. Did you know that it is said that 87% of physical and mental illnesses today are the result of negative thoughts? 87%. That means that when our thought life is toxic, it starts to produce itself and starts to um, go through our physical bodies, reproduce it through our physical bodies. Third John chapter two says, I pray that you be in health and prosper even as your soul prospers. So notice that health and prosperity in our health is linked to our soul prospering. What is our soul? Mind, will, and emotions. So maybe we could take the opposite as true as well. If I am not prospering in my soul, It's next to impossible to get prosperity in my physical body. How can I get healing in my body and be well physically if I'm not well in my mind, my will and emotions, or my spirit? That's extremely important. Maybe some of you all have been dealing with that. Maybe somebody in here needs healing in different kinds of ways. Maybe you might need physical healing. Maybe you might need healing from some mental things, some mental torment, or maybe healing in your emotions. Maybe there's some things in life that have happened over the last year 
that have really tried to leave a mark on you. And what the enemy will try to do is he'll try to replay that tape. Over and over and yeah. over and over. And you know, the longer you think about it, the more you access it mentally, the stronger. Actually, psychologists have found that the stronger and bigger it becomes literally in your brain. Yeah. Physiologically, it actually starts to take up more space and more neurons actually start to get engulfed by that thought. So the more I access it, the bigger it becomes and the bigger it becomes and the bigger it becomes. How do you know that a thought has become real big? when you can get to it really easily all the time. It's almost like that thought interrupts your previous thought. I was thinking about what I'm going to wear tonight at youth service, and then the thought came again. And the enemy will try to get us to think on it to the point where it becomes our whole world, to the point where it becomes our expectation. Maybe this will happen again. Maybe they'll leave me again. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll be abused like this again. But Jesus died to bring healing to the brokenhearted. Not just physically, but internally as well. I want to bring this to an end. But I want to do an example first. Because we're at internship, right? We're being trained, right, as disciples. We're being trained as kingdom citizens to be able to affect the world around us. So I asked Pastor Greg, and he did so, so very well, I asked him to bring me this for a demonstration. Because we are the vessels that God uses. We're here to represent Christ, right? Who's the healer? Jesus. Our job is to represent Christ or to re-present God to the world. How does God get presented to the world? Through us. Christ in you, the hope of glory. So I have this uh, extension cord, and then I have this lamp. Now this lamp works, and the electricity works as well. We know it because we're sitting under light, and Choose Life Church has so wonderfully paid the electric bill. Shout out to you guys. What happens if I plug this in? Let's see. Oh, look at that. All right, it turns on. No surprise there. What happens if I disconnect it? It turns off. Now, what if I just want it to come on, but I don't plug it in? Uh, Okay, is it on? No, it's still off. Now, this light can't come on unless it's connected to the power source, unless it's connected into the electricity. The light in the cord itself isn't electricity. It is just a vessel or a vehicle for the electricity to be displayed, to be shown, to be seen. What does Matthew chapter 5 verse 14 say? It says that we say, that's me. That's That's you. Turn to your neighbor, say, that's you. you. Turn to your other neighbor, the good looking one, say, that's you. You You are the light of the world. A city set up on a hill that is never meant to be hidden. But how does your light shine? It doesn't just shine because you're cute or you dress well. It shines when you're connected to the power source. When you're plugged in, that is how your light shines. It's not about you. It's about what God wants to do through you. We are just the vessels. So the light automatically turns on when I plug it into the power source. What is the power source? God is the power source. The Holy Ghost is the power source. He's the one that gives us the power. It says in John chapter 14 and verse 10, Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me and the words that I speak to you? I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father in me who does the work. So it's God who does the work. Verse 12. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also in greater works than these he will do because I go to the Father. So he's going to do the same things he was doing through Jesus and more. That means that if Jesus was casting out devils, he wants me to cast out some devils. If Jesus was healing the sick, he wants me to heal the sick. If Jesus was preaching the gospel, he wants me to 
preach the gospel. If Jesus was raising up disciples, he wants me to raise up disciples. This is not an age thing. This is not a color, background, race, creed, or kind thing. This is not an education thing. This is a commission thing. It's for anybody who be in Christ. That's what we're called to do. And in Mark chapter 5, it says that the power of God went through that woman's body when she touched his garment. And what happened? Power flowed through him. What was that power? It was dunamis power. As it says in the Greek, this same power is the power that he talked about in Acts. When he said in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, when he said that you shall receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon you, that you may be witnesses for me. It said in Luke chapter 24 and verse 49, wait here in Jerusalem. Say, wait here. He told the disciples, don't leave. Wait here. Peter, that means you, wait here until you've been endued with power. That word endued actually literally means to be clothed with it. Until you've been clothed with the power that you need to be able to appropriate the kingdom of God or be a true witness for me, don't leave. That means that God always had a plan for us as believers and the way that we are supposed to display the kingdom. Displaying the kingdom was never meant to just be preached. It was meant to be demonstrated. And the demonstration validates the preaching. I got news for you. You ready? Without the demonstration, Christianity is just another religion. Jesus didn't die to add another religion to Buddha and Confucius and Allah and Islam. He died so that we could be restored in our rightful relationship with God and we could have the power of the Holy Ghost to be able to do the same thing that he's done for us in the lives of others. That's what Jesus did. So I want to do a demonstration. And we're ending with this here. Okay, my time is up. I want to say this as a preface. I'm a more laid back person as a personality. That's how I am. I'm a laid back person. I got any of my laid back folks in here. Y'all cool or whatever. I'm a laid back person. I'm more of an introvert. You might say, what, Pastor Dave? I know it's hard to believe. I am more of an introvert by nature. Let me tell you something that's real. You know, I used to be really hesitant to pray for people, to lay hands on people, because I would always be thinking, and the enemy would try to put these thoughts in my mind, what if it doesn't work? What if they don't receive healing? Or what if this prophetic word is, is not completely accurate? Or what if I'm missing it? Or what, just the what ifs. And so what the enemy tries to do is he tries to capitalize on those doubts and tries to get those doubts to convince you to stay in the chair. To not say anything, to not offer prayer, to not offer healing, to not lay hands on the sick. He tries to convince you that it's your job to heal people. But really, it's his job to heal people. He supplies the electricity. We're just the vessel. It's his job to heal people. It's his reputation on the line. It's not about me, David. Sometimes they don't even know who my name is. So I wanted to demonstrate this with you because I wanted to make sure that we had a real training session. God bless you. Does anybody in here right now, you'd be bold and courageous enough, say that you need healing in your body somewhere, some kind? Does anybody need healing in their body? Okay, praise God. Um, I'm going to take you. Come on up. I saw your hand first. You mind standing right here for me? What's your name? Brindy. Brindy. Nice to meet you, Brandy. Is anybody here bold enough to pray for Brindy? Come on up. I saw your hand first. First of all, I want to applaud both of you. It takes courage. It takes courage to say, hey, I need healing. Absolutely. What's your name? Janiah. Janiah. Brindy and Janiah. 
Janiah takes courage to say, hey, I'm going to pray for it. Now, what did we talk about? We talked about the four steps. We talked about rebuking sickness, pain, and disease. We talked about receiving healing, so commanding healing. We talked about um, comfort, comfort of the Holy Spirit, and wholeness. So what I want you to do is I want you to pray for Brindy, right? Brindy, do you mind if I ask you what you need healing for? Okay. Would you mind telling us? Okay. 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 All right. Do you mind praying for her? Okay. All right. You don't have to touch if you don't want to. I respect the protocol. I understand. But but what a <laughs> protocol. So I want you to do these four things. Have you ever prayed for somebody to receive healing? Okay. Perfect. So you know all about this. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. She know all about this. But the thing I want you to focus on is it's not you who does the work. You know that. It's God who does the work. And I want you to pray for her, rebuke sickness, command healing. I want to pray for comfort and for wholeness. All right? I want you to stretch your hand this way. Put your full agreement with them that the power of God is going to hit her body. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. will come out of her body father i thank you that this is not of this is not of you father but this is of the devil father i thank you that she does your word father so that her body aligns with what your word says father i command healing to her body father i thank you for this healing i thank you that your word says by jesus stripes she was healed he was he bore sickness so that she could be healed father i release comfort into her body father i thank you that she is whole father i thank you that since she has healing father she does not um, she does not second guess this, Father, but she has healing, Father. And I thank you for wholeness in her body, Father. And I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on. Yes. I love it. I love it. Thank you so much. Hey, hold on. Don't leave. All right. So there's a couple different ways that healing manifests. Sometimes healing comes instantly. Praise God. We can receive that, right? Sometimes healing will manifest over a shortened time span. Yeah. So maybe healing will manifest over the next yeah. hour, yeah. next 24 hours. And then there might be a case where you say, well, it's been 24 hours. Just continue to believe yes. that what you pray for yes. will come to pass. Right. Now, a lot of times as you're praying for healing, you want them to try to do something. I know sometimes when it's internal, it's kind of hard to, you know, do something that's internal. But a lot of times when we do healing at our church, we do healing service. If it's a pain in, in an arm, okay, we want you to move your arm. If it's a pain internal, we want you to check that thing. If it's a pain here, you know, do something to be able to check that. Because a lot of times the enemy will try to convince us not to do anything. Oh, I'm good. But what did Jesus say? Rise, take up your bed and walk. The paralytic always had an opportunity not to do anything. The paralytic could have sat there. What do you think would have happened if he just sat there? He probably would have been sitting there. So a lot of times when we do something to be able to show forth the manifestation of that healing, God is even working in the midst of that. How do you feel right now? I feel good. Like my nose is starting to clear up. Praise God. Amen. How's your throat feel? It's not as bad. Sure. Amen. Praise God. We're believing for complete healing in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank you so much. You all may be seated. Now that takes a lot of courage, especially to come up here on the stage. We put on the spot. And thank you so much. And I know you raised your hand. What's your name, young lady? Sky. Sky? And, and, and what do you need healing for? Stuffy nose. Stuffy nose. It's almost like the same thing as her, huh? Praise God. Let's reach our hands to Sky right now. Heavenly Father, we command. Yes. Hallelujah. We command 
uh, uh, healing, Father. Right now, we rebuke sickness and disease from sky in the name of Jesus. You sent your word and healed us and delivered us from all of our diseases. And by your stripes, she is healed. So we command healing right now. We command uh, that, that stuffiness to release right now. And any other infirmity or virus that's trying to attack her body, we command it to die instantly. We release the comfort of the Holy Ghost to comfort her body. And we declare wholeness for her in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, this is really, really important because this happened to me during COVID multiple times. I'm going to say this to you all, but this is actually for the benefit of everybody. As you are confessing healing, believing for healing, receiving healing, there might be times where the Holy Ghost will speak to you specifically about something to do or not to do, a place to go or not to go, or some level of instruction that will get you to alter or tailor your normal behaviors. There was actually several times during COVID where the Holy Spirit specifically instructed me to do some specific things. One of it, one of the times, one day he actually specifically told me to go on an all juice fast for 24 hours. So I bought a bunch of produce. I juiced it. I felt fine though. Here's the thing. I felt fine. But the Holy Ghost knows how to keep you in line with your confession. Because my confession is that I walk in divine health and healing every day. So I did it. The juice was fine. 24 hours later, I kind of went back to normal. Never felt a thing in my body. But the Holy Spirit knows what may have been trying to attack my body. He might know what kind of vitamins I was depleted of, what kind of minerals I might have needed in that moment. The Holy Ghost, he's the best physician. He's going to lead you and guide you.